The Forum at 8 with Kolani Gwala. Right, uh, time now, seven minutes after eight, and uh, very good morning to you. A warm welcome to the Forum at 8 here on SAFM, South Africa's news and information leader. Well, this morning, we're discussing foreign direct investment. Uh, it may sound a little technical, but ultimately what we would like to get to is what does foreign direct investment do uh, in terms of development, in terms of creating jobs, and in terms of addressing some of the socio-economic uh, challenges that we talk about ever so often here on the program. Last week, you may have heard this, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development uh, issued a report. They said foreign direct investment in South Africa grew sharply to $5.8 billion, which is uh, about 47.1 billion rand from 1.2 billion in 2010. Uh, South Africa was the second biggest African recipient of FDI, trailing Nigeria, which attracted 8.9 billion US dollars. However, total FDI to Africa fell last year due to political problems in North Africa, which traditionally attracted about a third of the continent's FDI inflows. Now, on the forum this morning, we would obviously like to examine the changing patterns of uh, foreign direct investments and also the impact on development and some of the socioeconomic issues that we raise here on the program. We would like to hear your thoughts then. Uh, 0891-104-208. We'll take your calls a little later on. 0891-104-208. But also send me a text message at 34701, 34701 or an email at gualax at sabc.co.za, gualax at sabc.co.za. Well, let's start in Switzerland then, introducing our guest. We have on the line Mr. Shin Ohinata. He is the publishing economist at United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. A very good morning to you, Mr. Ohinata. Thank you for your time this morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Thanks indeed. Well, and here in South Africa, we are joined on the line by Minister Rob Davis. He's the Minister for Trade and Industry. A very good morning to you, Mr. Davis. Minister Davis. Uh, good morning, Arnie. Good morning to the listeners. Thanks indeed. And here with me in studio, Mr. Victor Khomiaswana is Business Development Executive at PPC. Uh, he has uh, extensive knowledge of uh, business practices across Africa. He advises and assists multinationals with their expansion into and across our continent. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Khomiaswana. Thank you very much for your time this good morning. Good to see you, Tolani. Good morning. Thank you very much. Let me start with, with Mr. Ohinata here. Uh, give us the basic facts about FDI in, 20, 12, in 2011 in relation to South Africa and Africa in general. Well, um, well, uh, as you mentioned, the um, FDI inflow to South Africa recovered sharply to uh, more than uh, almost six billion. But uh, what what we have to take into account is that FDI uh, varies widely from year to year. So, what happens on one specific year is not particularly important. But from the figure six billion, what I see is that. Uh, South Africa is back on track. That is, as, as I understand it, there was a bit of a concern last year that the uh, FDI to South Africa was very low in 2010, but now it's back on six billion. So um, it is more, more or less on the, back on the trend. Hmm. According to your analysis, are you able to tell us why uh, hmm? South Africa is back on track? Well, uh, like I said, I mean, uh, it's not that South Africa, but uh, it happens to many countries, like even large countries like Germany and the UK, that uh, it, 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 it somehow, it, it's a nature of things that it varies a lot. If you look back over the years, it used to be um, uh, almost in 2005, and then it recovered sharply, and then it came down. So it, it is very sensitive to um, uh, general economic situation, and uh, so it, it, so I would say the, the figure year on year is not particularly important. And you, you have to bear in mind that FDI is not a, it's not investment you and I often think of. FDI is about financial transactions in and out of the country. So, uh, given that given that it, it is a uh, financial transactions, it can it, its values can vary a lot. But is it fair to assume that it follows certainty, policy certainty, political certainty, and economic certainty even? Indeed, over the uh, I'd say over the mid to long term, it does matter that uh, the that uh, policy does uh, policy influences the FDI. 
But on the other hand, what we see is that uh, lots of investment in Africa is driven by natural resources. And uh, these such investment tends to be, uh, policy is important, but tends to be less affected by policy environment than uh, some other sensitive sectors. But uh, how also... How do we compare with the developed world in terms of attracting FDI? I'm talking here as South Africa, but also as as the developing world. Mm-hmm. Well, South Africa is a bit exceptional among the developing world. It is the uh, it is the second largest recipient, as I mentioned, uh, as you mentioned, and. Uh, <clears throat> hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm sure when you, sorry, um, when you say when you how, how you compare, I mean, uh, I, 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 I wonder what what kind of um, well, I'm, what, comparison. Yeah. What, what I'm saying is is whether or not yeah. investors are looking for the same things that they look for in the developed world when they come to invest in 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 our economy. Hmm? Well, if we look at the uh, uh, M and A uh, acquisitions of South, South African companies by foreign companies and. Uh, investment of a uh, new product capacity last year there were indeed there was uh, many investment in the mining sector but there were also investment in telecommunications and uh, retail sector and also even the uh, automotive manufacturing so south africa is more fortunate than other african countries in that its inward investment is more diversified but nevertheless, it seems that the mining is still the main, the main main sector. Sure. I'll bring in my other guests in a minute. But Mr. Ohonata, I suppose the basic question that a South African would like to, to ask is whether or not this translates into any change in issues of development, in issues of job creation. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that, that's the, um, something I, would, I, I really want to emphasize, that FDI is just money coming in. For instance, if a foreign company takes over a South African, South African company, then where does the money go? It just goes to the shareholders. So in that sense, not all of FDI translates into the creation of a new employment, new productive capacity. However, it does. Uh, it can, for instance, uh, this uh, establishment of a manufacturing uh, auto manufacturing center by. I think it's a Taiwanese company, then it does happen that uh, some employment is created. But so FDI, you have to see case by case uh, where, the money, where the money is coming from, the nature of the investment, and um, where the money is going. All right, let me bring it back then to, to our trade and industry. Minister Rob Davis, are you celebrating this almost $6 billion uh, FDI last year? Um, I, I, I don't really comment on the calculation and the amount. I haven't uh, had an opportunity to study the report in detail, but I think that the trend line that there is increasing FDI flow to South Africa and to Africa is actually what uh, I'm picking up. And I think it's very much linked to the, uh, the change in uh, global economic geography. Um, and uh, in, in that, of course, the headlines are dominated by the crisis in Europe and concerns about the crisis in Europe. But behind that, and very, very many forums that one attends and many interactions that I've been having, and I've been traveling quite a lot at different parts of the world and telling our story. And I think that what's happening is that dynamic companies around the world, uh, dynamic countries that are capital uh, surplus countries, are now beginning to say that they cannot afford not to be involved in Africa. And that uh, within Africa, South Africa has a particular role because South Africa is, as uh, was mentioned, the most industrialized country on the African continent continent. And I think that we are seeing a growing interest uh, across the board. Uh, And I could give all kinds of examples uh, uh, from countries which have not been involved very much in our our, um, uh, part of the world who are now beginning to think about increasing their involvement. So I think that the the trend line is is something which I I could confirm from uh, uh, the work that we've been doing. And of course, uh, you know, we are actively trying to encourage investments which build productive capacity, which contribute to our infrastructure program, which I must say uh, is also uh, attracting a lot of interest around the world as well. But I guess the, the, the big question again is whether or not we're starting to see the results or the impact of, of this FDI then on the ground. 
Well, I think already, for example, in the motor industry, we have uh, seen uh, 15 billion uh, uh, rands of investment since the crisis. Uh, and I think that that uh, reflects itself in uh, an interest of, ma- of the manufacturing companies to increase their presence in South Africa. Uh, I mean, on uh, uh, last week, we were at uh, Toyota with the, the, the new quantum uh, manufacturing plant was launched. Uh, so I think that uh, there is an interest across the board uh, in um, uh, deepening involvement. We are trying to pick up on that. Uh, and of course, we're trying to ensure that that results in uh, flows that are going to strengthen our manufacturing capacity and of course, uh, grow uh, employment. That's uh, right. our fundamental objective. All right. I'll just oppose that uh, with some of the predictions that have been out there about how our economy is likely, for instance, to do this year. But before I do that, Minister, let me come back to Mr. Khomiaswana here with me in the studio. He travels the continent on a, on a weekly basis. Uh, is there evidence on the ground that people are maybe starting to benefit from this FDI increase? Certainly. Think about it, Kolani, if, and, and it's the point that, uh, that uh, is it Mr. Ohinata yeah, that, that Ohinata, he makes yeah. about. Not all FDI will translate into jobs, especially if your FDI includes measures and acquisitions sometimes where you get one company taking over another company and instead of increasing jobs in the name of increasing competitiveness, you end up cutting down jobs. You, you understand what I'm saying? That mm. sometimes I come into your country, buy a company, and I say, this company is uncompetitive. Let me do one, two, three to cut down the costs so that I can return the value to the shareholders. So it is true that not all FDI will, will, will result to, in job creation. But on the African continent, I mean, if you're talking about the property boom, you want to talk to a city like Dar es Salaam, you want to go to Accra or Tokradi or even Juba, mm where there is nothing effectively. So when you have nothing or you're coming off a low base, sometimes it is very important to emphasize you are going to see evidence. So outside of South Africa, because you can't compare Johannesburg, say, to Nairobi, because Johannesburg would have very far advanced infrastructure, public transport system. If you look at the how train, you, you can't compare. So if you are outside of South Africa, the evidence is even much more pronounced. But we got to emphasize that a Kinshasa or a Lubumbashi or an Accra or a Lagos, any city in Africa, as long as the economy is growing, will show evidence of that. And of course, it doesn't matter what kind of FDI it is in those circumstances, mm. because somebody is going to be opening an hotel, which means construction will happen. Of course, we want to guard against companies that bring in construction, infrastructure, in, uh, investment, and bring their own employees to work on the contracts. But mostly, when you are building an hotel in Johannesburg, you will create jobs in Johannesburg. If you are building a road between Johannesburg and Bologwani, there will be people along the way that get employment. Mm. And in that way, FDIs always have to is, is, is having to be a welcome sign that the continent is attracting investment. Just look at the numbers. The global the global inflows in Africa, I think, being 25% up on last year, mm. Whereas, which means that developing markets even, which uh, have investment up 11%, are not as doing well as Africa is. So Africa is even ahead in terms of some of the rise of FDI inflows compared to the rest of the developing markets. Mm. Although some developing markets, of course, are still favored than African economies. All right, let's go back to Mr. Ohinata again. Mr. Ohinata, I just want to know from you then, given given uh, the fact that we're not, um, I suppose, getting the full benefit, maximum benefit out of this FDI, Mm -hmm. what is it that as Africans we should do in order to ensure that uh, the majority of the FDI that comes through isn't Mm -hmm. just to create profits for the shareholders, but also it leaves an impact, a legacy on Africa? Uh, just just, uh, just uh, before answering your questions, uh, this year we created an index of how much FDI contrib- contributes to the economy. And, and uh, in fact, South Africa, relative to the size of the economy, does not receive as much FDI as it could potentially do. Hmm. But... It is uh, uh, from the given amount of FDI, South Africa has benefited, benefited more than most countries in terms of job creation, value added, and uh, even export. But this is just an index, and an index can never be a, a true reflection of the reality. But there is a prima facie case that South Africa is not doing so badly out of uh, FDI. Hmm. And just to coming back to your question, how how the a country can benefit from uh, FDI. Hmm. Well, uh, the important thing is that uh, you, you need 
FDI in itself is neither good nor bad. Uh, e- each country has to decide whether FDI is serving the development objective of the country. So in the case of South Africa, it, 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 indeed there is lots of uh, FDI mining. Is it a good thing or bad thing? It's, it's for the, the, the policy makers and the, the people in the country, the country to decide. Um, <clears throat> Whether uh, I guess there's a question that you, whether you could, in some ways, force foreign companies to play a more social role within the economy. Of course, that's possible, but on the other hand, that that risks uh, putting off potential foreign investors. Mm-hmm. So then, then, then there's a balance to be struck. Um, it's very difficult for um, for people outside to make a general case about. Uh, regulation, but uh, on the one hand, investors expect returns. Uh, on the other hand, the country should expect certain uh, social and developmental benefits. So mm. All right, let's have a striking right balance. Sure. Let me pick up on this point about about FDI being good or bad. What would be the potential bad effects of FDI? Well, it's not well again. FDI is just uh, money on the balance of payment. It, it's I guess you, you you are more talking about uh, the potential bad impact of uh, say foreign companies. Why are you, are you more talking about FDI? And Minister, I'm bringing this point because because I think I've heard people say perhaps um, we, we we as a country and an economy sometimes bend over backwards trying to inv- you know uh, uh, create conducive conditions for for foreign direct investment and we don't see the results. Is that a question for me or for the minister? I'm just asking the minister, minister, to comment on that. Yes, uh, well, I think that um, uh, whether or not we get the benefits doesn't just depend on whether there's uh, foreign ownership or foreign entry of capital. Uh, it depends on a whole lot of other things. So I think, for example, in uh, our industrial policy, uh, we work with investors uh, in uh, both national and domestic, and we offer them all kinds of um, uh, support measures, sometimes incentives, for example, the 12i tax incentive and so on. And I think increasingly what we're looking to do is to try to extract uh, uh, definite concessions uh, that if we give you a benefit, we expect to see a result measured in the first instance in terms of employment. Uh, and I think we have been more insistent about that than we have been in the past. Uh, and it is based on the on the understanding that uh, the nature of a transaction uh, and whether it's a, a foreign inflow or not doesn't necessarily mean uh, that uh, it's beneficial. Whether it's beneficial or not depends on where it's flowing, what kind of activity it's supporting, and so on and so forth. Um, I do think, though, that, as I said earlier on, that the climate is changing in such a way that if we play our cards right, I believe we can attract uh, a degree of foreign investment that is going to actually uh, support our productive activities, uh, including our infrastructure and our manufacturing, uh, uh, along with uh, the existing flows into uh, mining and so on. So um, I think it's really uh, now it's, it's, it's up to us. But, um, uh, you know, when, when, when people make uh, comments about, for example, the, the Walmart transaction uh, and say that uh, <clears throat> Uh, you know, uh, we should be adopting an attitude of uh, of, of of not uh, uh, addressing the substance of that of that particular transaction because it's a foreign transaction. I think that's where we where we, we we would want to disagree and say that uh, no, fundamentally we have to look at the the nature of the transaction and ensure that the transaction in question uh, has the kind of positive benefits that we want to see from it. All right, um, I, I, Mr. Komiyasana, that's the whole point because sometimes when you challenge transactions such as the Walmart transaction. People yeah. say the, the impression you're sending out there is that South Africa is closed for business. Bending over backwards. No, no, no. FDI. no, no. Investors just want certainty. Uh, they, they, investors know that for every return, for every benefit you want, you're going to take a risk. And they are going to assess the level of risk in your country depending on what other countries have to offer. So the minister is right. You have to ask questions. We are a South Africa that has priorities. We are South Africa that is important in the African scheme of things because our financial markets are important to the investment climate of the whole continent. There are many countries in Africa that depend on our stock exchange to raise capital. They depend on South African banks and so on. So you cannot make conditions that are going to put you at a disadvantage because then you are selling your country out. The the, the important thing that investors want to know is what is the game 
plan, what are the rules of the game, and don't change them in midstream. That's all that you need to do. You go to China, you go to Australia, there are all kinds of conditions. And you, you can't run away because if you look at the return, if it's justified, you're going to stay. Now, if you look at South Africa, by investing in South Africa, you can get into a whole lot of other African countries. Mozambique next door, high growth economy. Most of the mining companies that are there are invested in South Africa as well, or indirectly they are. So by making conditions that suit your country, that are reasonable, you are not going to be chasing away any investor. Mostly commentators are dramatic in how they paint the picture. Mm -hmm. That if you say, I insist that if you invest in my country, you must develop skills or you must beneficiate, or you must add value in manufacturing, or you must build schools in the neighborhood that you are. As long as you tell investors up front, there's no corruption, and the rules aren't going to change in the middle of the game, the investors will be happy to do that. Right. We'll take a commercial break. What are your thoughts, though? 891 104 Another issue that we'll raise in a minute is also the sustainability of this FDI, given the global economic conditions. Other people are saying, for instance, what you see in the United States uh, with the jobs report over the weekend is because business is not in investing in that country. There is in this country also an assertion that there is a bit of a, an investment strike going on, sustainability going forward then. 891 27 after 8. The Forum at 8 with Polani Guala. And that brings us now to 26 minutes before 9. 9 to 12, by the way, today, coming out of Tanzania. Uh, she will be joining us from there. So look out for Sigelelo Mkabadele on Morning Talk between 9 and 12 here on SAFM. For now, though, we're talking about foreign direct investment to South Africa, to Africa, what it means for us going forward. And, and in a minute or two, of course, we'll be talking about the sustainability uh, of this kind of FB, uh, FDI. How do we make sure that the, the foreign direct investment that we're talking about, remember, I said that the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, uh, said that in their report, uh, FDI in South Africa grew sharply to 5.8 billion US dollars. That's about 47.1 billion rand last year from 1.2 in 2010. So then we're looking at the, the implications of all of that. Uh, and my guest on the program at this time on the, line, on the line from Switzerland is Mr. Shin Ohinata. He is the publishing economist at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And here with me in studio, Mr. Victor Homieswana. He's business development executive at PPC. And as I mentioned, he travels across the continent extensively and uh, brings us his uh, first, uh, first-hand account, really, of what is happening on the ground. On the line, we're joined by Minister Rob Davis, Minister of Trade and Industry. Industry. Let's just take some calls then, 891 I'm going to come back, talk about sustainability and other issues. But let's start with Sig and Randberg. Hello, Sig. Thank you very much, Kulani. Hi. Kulani, and, and good morning to the minister and everybody else there. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask the minister whether South Africa really is opposed to a free enterprise because we could have had 16,000 million rands worth, 16 billion rands worth of investment a year or two ago already from Walmart, uh, the American multinational who wants to invest here. But three government departments, including Mr. Davis's department, have been fighting that investment uh, uh, which is a purely a free enterprise based thing they are not importing american imperialism or anything of the sort they are just competing fairly and freely and how dare we uh, 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 throw that kind of uh, opposition in the face of 16000 million and that money does create jobs okay. this is what it's about and the anc is waging a national series a serious a debate the ANC is still waging about nationalization of most targets of foreign investment, including okay. mines and banks. And then, if anybody would dare to invest in South Africa, they would have to give away 25% to start off with to black empowerment without any productive return. And so it goes on and on. Hmm. Uh, we, right. are, we are not allowing these people to bring money here to employ our people. All right, Sig, uh, we'll ask the minister to respond to you. But let's quickly hear from Joseph, also here in Johannesburg. Hello, Joseph. Hi, welcome. Yes, thank you. Uh, Joseph I mean, uh, the, the after effect for mm -hmm. I think the minister has addressed that. That indeed, some of this FDR, the long time after effect, it leads to the loss of jobs because people are looking at the, uh, the, the shareholders' uh, value. Secondly, 
is that the jobs that are created uh, are, are jobs that are not decent. And as a country, we have signed the Decent Country Work Program in 2010. So these questions that the minister is asking, that indeed they can't sit back and don't answer, ask these difficult questions because the archive effect becomes very directorious rather than effective and take us forward. Thank you. All right, Joseph uh, in Johannesburg, thank you very much. I suppose, Minister, uh, the two callers answering each other in a way. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, uh, first of all, I should probably make the point that many, many foreign investment transactions that take place, particularly in the productive economy, do take place uh, with the support, encouragement, and a lot of hard work by government. Uh, so if we're recording an increasing trend, it's also because of uh, work by uh, government departments uh, and particularly our own trading investment in South Africa. Uh, on the Walmart transaction, as I said earlier on, uh, this was uh, an investment-specific uh, or transaction-specific uh, uh, issue. Um, and, uh, in fact, it's a, it was a deal between it's a, it was a merge and acquisition, as was mentioned earlier on. Mergers and acquisitions uh, just mean uh, a change of ownership. It was a merge and acquisition transaction between two foreign-owned companies, two foreign-owned entities. And uh, I think it was our responsibility to make sure that that, uh, which re- would result in the entry of the largest uh, uh, retail company in the world, to the South African market, that this actually uh, supported uh, productive activities in South Africa. That's what the issue is all about. Uh, We haven't, um, in fact, uh, said no to the transaction. The issue now is that the Competition uh, Appeal Court uh, has uh, um, got us to appoint experts. Those experts have delivered their reports, and uh, the Competition Appeal Court will now apply its mind to setting the terms on that transaction, uh, which can ensure that, in fact, uh, some of the things that are said uh, by the emerging parties that they want to support uh, um, new entrants into uh, um, uh, various uh, uh, um, uh, value chains and so on that the company is responsible for, that these actually happen. And I think that uh, one of the experiences around the world is that sometimes there are all kinds of promises made uh, by foreign investors and uh, they don't materialize. And I think it's our responsibility as government to make sure that where uh, particularly uh, regulatory uh, uh, permission has to be granted or, or support Support measures are granted uh, that we make sure that we do extract uh, the the benefits that okay. have been promised in the first instance. All right, let me read some SMSs for Mr. Khomiaswane here with me in studio. Somebody says, "I'm told in China and Botswana, if you're a foreign company, you must sell part of the company to locals before you can be granted a trading license. Why not in South Africa?" That's one SMS. Here's another one from Spewer in Kempton Park, who says, "Is there any active legislation to ensure that our country is not exploited in the name of FDI?" And Joe in PE says, "What effect does labor union activity?" have on FDI. Uh, please respond to those three for me, if you may, uh, Mr. Khomiasson. Well, if you are in Saudi Arabia, there's something called Saudiization. If you are in Botswana, I think they call it the Citizen Economic Empowerment Program. Zimbabwe, as you know, has indigenization. Kenya in the 70s tried a program equivalent to what we call BEE in South Africa. You can't go to Australia and just own a company without the participation of the locals. You can't do it in the... You just can't do it anywhere, Kolani. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's not sensationalize the issue of local participation. Now, who wants anybody to come into their backyard and operate a business and not create value? Now, if that value is created in the form of ownership that's prescribed, it's one story. But the one thing I can emphasize size. I mean, I don't travel on in Africa for, for leisure. I travel for business. You ask the questions first. What are the local conditions? What are the priorities? In fact, when I was a consultant, that's what I told most of my clients. Find out the priorities of the country into which you want to invest first. Try and align your investment with the priorities of the government, not of the politicians, of the government. The government might say, we want to create jobs. If you can contribute to that, you're going to be looked at more favorably than if you're not creating jobs. Mm -hmm. So I I don't even, to me, that's a no-brainer. If you're going into my backyard, you're going to play in my backyard. I want to know you'll create some benefits for me otherwise you are exploiting my country and you are taking more than you are giving china is the same deal india is the same deal. india actually had to relax some legislation i can't remember what it was but the, you couldn't just go into india and own without participation of the local people there has to be some trade-off that's what i mean minister davis is trade and industry when you trade it's give and take there's nobody who's ever going to just take 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 if you do that is a recipe for disaster and and uh, investors understand that investors and i'm an investor now when i travel for ppc that's what i do i'm inquiring about what countries require 
why we were in the DRC with the DTI not so long ago, finding out what are the conditions of investing in the DRC. Where are we going to make a contribution to the development of the country? Luckily with cement, I mean, you actually are part of the infrastructure development. So it's very easy to find a way of aligning. But just about every investor, if you go into any country, you have to, it's, it's prudent to understand, first of all, what the game in the country you're going is about. Mm. I, I, I've not seen an investor who's averse to that. It's mostly people when they have discussions i mean i, I don't want to get contentious but when we discuss the issue let's first understand what it is you, you're coming into a country there are priorities find a way either that or you're going to deal with environmental impact or you're going to deal with social responsibility all those things as long as they are done transparently as long as they are done in a sensible manner and often negotiation will happen the government the private sector will sit and talk about this. Then you have the likes of the IDC who are putting money into these deals that will also make conditions and ask how they can make sure the deal is much more equitable. We'll take more calls. 0891-104-208. Mr. Ohinata, I, I mentioned just yes. before our headlines there, uh, I don't know firstly whether you want to comment on what our, my callers have said, but also just talk to me a little bit about the sustainability then of this FDI going forward. What are the prospects? Mm -hmm. uh, just to comment on the uh, comment of the callers. Uh, when you talk about the uh, acquisition of South, Af South Af African companies, what you see is uh, headline numbers, that is, what's the value of the transaction. But this, this is not, this is just one just goes to the shareholders. So what's important is to see what, what the uh, investor does after this transaction takes place. Mm. Um, so that's, uh, that's something to take, uh, take note of. And uh, you you, uh, some callers talked about making um, foreign companies in some ways contribute more to the economy. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can put measures <laughs> make these companies pay m m more for the uh, for, for the benefit of the local economy. But then, what you don't see is that the investment that has been put off by such measures, which uh, which might have come but uh, did not realize. So mm. the, again, there is a balance to be struck that uh, you can put measures in, but then it might scare off some investors. So this thing about scaring off investors is not really just a, a scarecrow because every time, especially here, uh, there mm -hmm. are uh, difficult policy discussions going on. Uh, mm -hmm. The answer that you usually hear is that investors will run away. Well, uh, like... <laughs> It's never easy to make a sort of a general statement whether it does or it doesn't, but it's just uh, the point to be make note of. It is legitimate to make companies contribute to the social dimension of the economy, but if the cost is too high, uh, it, it would put off investors. But these investments you never see, so you may never realize that some investors are considering investment in South Africa. So just because you don't see it, it doesn't mean that uh, doesn't mean that uh, there is no cost to such measures. Hmm. Let me just go back to the point then about the sustainability of these mm -hmm. uh, inflows uh, going forward. What what, what are mm -hmm. the prospects? Uh, I, for South Africa. Yes. Okay. So, uh, I would say in general, uh, for uh, the prospect is positive for Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africa. Like I said, the uh, the decline, a small decline for Africa as a whole is only because of North Africa. And for the Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, 2011 was a good year, and this trend is likely to continue. And uh, South, South Africa would be a main beneficiary of this uh, positive trend and positive outlook for Southern Africa. Will will this uh, increased inflow be because of the global economic slowdown or despite of the economic uh, slowdown? Well, then I would say two, two things. Um, first, uh, despite the slowdown in China, um, uh, this uh, mining, global mining boom is going to continue for a while, <laughs> including South Africa. Mm -hmm. And also that um, there is some, really uh, some positive um, sense about where the uh, Africa is going, and uh, I think in, uh, invest, 
investor investors assessment general general assessment of the investors are changing and um, uh, not just in South Africa but in the whole of Saharan Africa mm. therefore uh, well, we, we are po- uh, upbeat about the pros- prospect of South Africa nevertheless like I said at, at the beginning the year on year change is not that important what you should Uh, 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 trends over over the years. Okay, well, fantastic. I would like to pick up uh, Mr. Khomiyaswana on that point, perhaps also bringing in the minister a little later on of of this uh, up bit positive attitude about where Africa may be going. No, certainly. Africa, 54 states, and remember, South Africa now is part of the FTA, the, 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 the Free Trade Alliance, I keep calling it Alliance, which will bring about a market of over 300 million people. If you just take SADC and what we call the Eastern East African community, mm. right up to Egypt or so, that is the positive thing about sustainability, that to bring all the 54 states of Africa together in a trade zone will mean this investment inflows will have to be sustained. And they cannot be broken. I mean, the cycle has been going on for a long time in Africa anyway. There might be a dip here and there, but even with a slowdown in China, it simply means China will not grow as fast as it has been. But of the emerging markets, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, offers the longer upside than the other developing markets because of exactly what I say. There's regionalization happening. More countries are coming together in regional blocks, creating more intra-Africa trade, which is another important thing. That FDI should not mean investment coming from Europe or from India or from China. It should also mean from South Africa into Kenya, from South Africa into uh, Ghana. And that is where the sustainability is going to come from. Because the more you get investment from outside, the more you create local activity, the more you create local activity with the right policy guidance from the African governments, Mm. you're going to create a bigger and bigger free trade zone. And that free trade zone means intra-Africa trade will increase. And that's why I'm bullish that for the next 50 years, I'm sure you'll see a lot of growth on the African continent. But that is dependent, Minister. And by the way, I'm going to go to Velem and Charles in Cape Town, Motala also on the line. Minister, it's dependent on on the improved intra-Africa trade because a lot of people are complaining about uh, the segmentation in Africa, that, that everyone is doing their own thing. There's no coordination continentally. Well, I think, in, um, uh, in, first of all, I'd say that I, I, I just want to confirm that I, I think the picture of Africa as the next growth frontier is increasingly widely recognized. Uh, already, I think, returns on investments in Africa are among the highest in the world. And that uh, without uh, any of the steps that we take in, I think that there is a growing interest in getting involved in the African continent. However, I do think that the integration story and the growth of uh, intra-regional trade, which we try to promote, and the ambition and the projects around Africa African industrialization are attracting an increasing interest. Uh, the um, combined SADC Comes East African community is actually a population of 600 to 700 million with a combined GDP of 1 trillion US dollars. And uh, I think that uh, a growing number of uh, companies, of capital surplus countries, uh, of uh, investors who have been investing in the traditional uh, developed uh, markets of the world are now saying they've got to get involved in the African continent. And I think that's the opportunity that that we have. So we don't have to um, be supplicants about foreign investment. We actually can uh, go to these places and say uh, say to people, look, here's our value proposition. Uh, If you're interested, uh, there's a a possibility of of a mutually beneficial relationship. Uh, You know, if you've got uh, all kinds of excuses or reasons why you don't want to get involved, you're going to lose out because uh, there are many, many other people that are interested in coming and are coming. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that's the the change that I'm noticing in the uh, in the in the external environment, and of course uh, we do work. And uh, as as uh, Mr. Komosa said earlier on, uh, we try to uh, give as much uh, uh, comfort to investors. We work with them. We help them through regulatory hurdles and so on and so forth. Uh, but we, we we're up front. We have a uh, uh, things that we demand. Uh, they are around empowerment. They are around employment creation. Uh, and I think that uh, I'm finding a growing acceptance of that. Okay, let's take some calls here. Valem in Durban. Good morning. Uh, good day, uh, you guys. I just would like to know. Uh, um, you know, uh, everybody is so against and, and so opposed to the Walmart thing and uh, looking it up so so seriously. But what about these Chinese traders that's in our country? You know, they import the cheapest, uh, poorest quality stuff in in our country, and they sell. If you walk into a shop, you see very little 
uh, African people working in it, creating uh, as, as, as an outsider walking into a store like that. It looks like they create no opportunities for any local people at this stage. Mm. The, when you buy something, there's no uh, sort of official tax invoice or a VAT number on their receipt. Nothing. When, when, is, when, when is the South African government going to uh, clamp down on these guys? Okay. And, uh, and there's thousands and thousands of them in South Africa. All Thank right. You. Well, um, the minister will respond to you in a minute. Let me go to Mutala also in Durban. Hello, Mutala. How are you? Hello. Now, the prime and the most important thing we should discuss is who largely benefits from the investment operation in South Africa. Mm-hmm. At present, such investment largely benefits the foreign investor and benefits very little the country where the investment is made. Mm. The cheaper labor force that is in the country where the investment comes, uh, does not come from. I'm saying where the investment comes from, the labor force is very expensive. And because we have a far cheaper labor force, the profits made from such investment are far greater. And therefore, that is the reason why these people are coming from Europe to Africa now. Mm. Profits that would be made in uh, their own country uh, it, it, it are far less. And therefore, they would rather go to a country where... Now, the only problem is they're afraid that they might nationalize or do something like that. And this is the only threat. All There's right. no other. As far as so, they are concerned, they want profit. In all right, Mutala, just, just a quick one for you before I let you go. Do, do you consider South African workforce cheap? much cheaper than the labor force in England, in Germany, in where the investment investors come from, or in USA. Mm. You okay. see, so the, therefore they can produce it cheaper and sell the same thing to Europe. Okay, Mutala, in Durban, my guest will respond to you in a minute. Let me take Charles also in Cape Town. Hello, Charles. Hi, Kulani Lucas. Hi, welcome. Uh, Kulani, I'd like to ask Mr. Komoto, the, the gentleman that's traveling up Africa. Um, mm. This so-called nationalization to yeah, in our country it seems like a swear word, but listen to your panel there. It's um, protection of, of your, your resources, your country's resources. And um, how is, is this, in the sense, like um, benefiting, like, for example, in Zimbabwe, we hear that there's a 51% you know, ownership of a Zimbabwean um, national. So do listen to, to, to these, um, these mining um, operations. If, if if this company is not making money, you know, with the, with the one percent local um, ownership, then they would have pulled out, and and it doesn't make sense that this these multinational is still in the country, hmm. they're benefiting, and that forty nine percent ownership, they're still making super profits. So, okay. to me, um, the, the 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 last meeting the ANC had. I think that trend, they must just enforce it. Thanks. All right. That's Charles in Cape Town. Perhaps I should start with you, Mr. Khomiyaswana. Yeah. I can't comment about nationalization the way it's being discussed, but I can comment about state participation in the industries. And I will leave South Africa for a while and go into Botswana. Botswana is a collaboration between a private sector entity and the government of Botswana. Namibia, Namdev, the same deal. In the DRC, there's Jekka Mines. When you operate a mine in the DRC, the government of the DRC owns a stake in your company via Jekka Mines. I can go on and on. Mm. So the participation of the state in the industries that are key, I do not think has a fundamental flaw in them. It's how you structure it. And if you agree with the investors and they're happy, I'm sure that's how the DBS of this world are operating in Botswana for all these years. I'm sure that can be worked out. As to who benefits from this, I'm happy. If my labor force is affordable, I'm happy to have investors come in. Mm. But hope that we will get our education right that more and more we will start creating more value adding jobs we get more south africans qualified and able to earn more if they can't earn it here they'll go and earn it elsewhere mm. we'll get the remittances as they send the money back home so in the end if you are into trade if you're into business into in commerce you have to agree that you're going to have to offer somebody something for them to invest in your country as long as the benefits in the long term can be sure. developed. minister some of your questions here but also uh let me read one or two emails in fact there's this one from tapelo perhaps adding to the question 
questions that you already have. Uh, Tapelo says, can you ask the minister uh, how South Africa is doing with its alliance with BRICS trading bloc? Is there any benefit accruing as a result of that alliance, says this email. But also there's another one from Mugoshi in Kelvin, minister, who says, please ask the minister, what value has Africa in particular gained from the exploitative nature of the vultures from Europe and elsewhere? Examples, China's industrial bank bought a huge stake in Standard Bank. Consequences, uh, the after more than or thereafter more than a uh, thousand employees retrenched. The same happened in Abs after receiving billions of rents from Barclays. They spent it on ivory tower that ran into billions, which also resulted in staff losing jobs in their hundreds. China, that's the third point, came here and decimated our country's textile industry, culminating in thousands of employees jobless. The minister must please answer direct to this question for a change, not obf- obfuscate. That's Bukhosi. Uh, minister? Well, thanks. Let me just start off with uh, the, the one about um, uh, it was put Chinese traders and just say that, that, that we don't uh, um, relate to those kinds of um, um, issues uh, on a national basis. What's the national origin of the people? But if they are, as we know, they are uh, illegal operations uh, involved in illegal imports with probably people who are undocumented and maybe doing other things as well. <laughs> Uh, we are actually uh, trying to improve the ways in which we can crack down on that. Um, And I think uh, we have a number of uh, activities going on around that, and we've had a few successes. But I think that we really want to know from the public out there, where is there such an operation, uh, concretely sitting in uh, this and that place? And uh, we will try to respond to that, because um, if there are illegal activities taking place in the illegal economy, we know that that's uh, uh, to the detriment of of jobs uh, in, in South Africa. Let me just say that I think that uh, the the presence of lots of uh, players in the African continent, or more players in the African continent, BRICS countries, uh, means that uh, the way in which we can deal with uh, a more diverse range of foreign investors is uh, is better for us. Uh, when there are more players, there's not a monopoly so much. Uh, you can extract a, a, a better deal. But I do want to make the point, <coughs> just to reiterate the point, that uh, what we get out of a foreign investor investment transaction does depend on the way we negotiate it, uh, both uh, ourselves as government in setting the terms if it's large, uh, and also the uh, the private sector partners that may be sure. involved in, in, in that particular deal. Okay. And I think we are saying uh, increasingly to, to, to any invest in South Africa, we expect investments in productive activities that create jobs, that support empowerment and... Uh, and, and uh, yield benefits uh, to our economy. Okay. Um, and, and then just to say, how has BRICS uh, uh, benefited us? Well, I think that uh, uh, we're members of the, of the most important uh, alliance of developing countries. Mm-hmm. There's all kinds of benefits from that. But last year, uh, we went to China and we said to them, we've got a huge problem, that we are exporting primary products to you, okay. and uh, we're buying value-added products from you. Uh, and they agreed with us that we should have a trade exhibition, and we're trying to follow that up with a whole series of additional activities. But last year, we managed to secure orders for 400 million rand. All right, Minister, of, uh, unfortunately, I'm, just, I'm completely out of time. To work, yeah. uh, to improve the terms of that uh, I'm completely out of time. Uh, unfortunately, we've got to wrap it up here. Uh, I really have got to thank all my guests for coming through and talking to us this morning. Uh, starting, of course, with Minister Rob Davis, as well as Mr. Shin Ohinata, Publishing Economist at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, joining us on the line from Switzerland. Apologies for uh, the line there, sometimes letting us down. Uh, but here with me in studio as well, Mr. Victor Khomyaswana, African Business Specialist, advising and assisting multinationals also, uh, of course, at PPC at this time. I thank you all for coming through. Hi, 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 I thank you all for coming through.